group, again, of not particularly related organizations, some of them Catholic, some of them Protestant, some of them Jewish, started to say, we have to save the children. That was Caroline Moorhead on the efforts of a group of French villagers to save people from ending up in Nazi concentration camps. Jamaica in 1946, it could almost have been 1846. It was a real place of old imperial certainties which had been lost. And that was Matthew Parker discussing Jamaica at the time when the James Bond novel were written. He'll be explaining the connection later in the episode. You're listening to the History Extra podcast from BBC History magazine. We're the UK's best-selling history magazine, available from all good news agents or via subscription. Check out our latest subscription deals at historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. The magazine is also now available on many digital devices, including the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play, Kobo and Zinio. Look out for us in your app store or newsstand or find out more at historyextra.com forward slash digital. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the History Extra podcast. I'm Rob Attar, the editor of BBC History magazine. First up this week is an interview with the author and biographer Caroline Moorhead. Her new book, A Village of Secrets, tells the complex story of the inhabitants of one French plateau who sheltered people fleeing the Nazis during the occupation of France. Our books editor, Matt Elton, met up with Caroline to find out more, and he started by asking what first interested her in the project. I wrote a book called A Train in Winter, which is, the, as it were, the first of this trilogy. Hmm. There's going to be this trilogy on resistance. The first one was a train, this one is a village, and the third one is a family. And when I came to the end of Train in Winter, I realised that the events in France took me up to the late autumn of 1942. So I sort of felt unfinished business. I wanted another story. For people who might not know, what, what happened to France uh, in the early years, and I suppose leading up to the Second World War as well? Leading up to the, to the Second World War, there was a certain amount of the communist uh, opposition, mm. which is actually quite crucial for the resistance when you enter the war. Um, okay, so war is declared, the Germans arrive, um, the French start sort of stirring, a sort of underground resistance. This is long before the Maquis. Mm. And um, they, the communists are the best organized. So they are, they are sort of... Um, groups and cells and networks and when the Germans took the whole of France in October, November 1942 um, the resistance intensified mm. and in this new book what I talk about is a plateau in the middle of France a series of villages and hamlets where for different reasons people decided to save uh, people that were being hunted down by the Gestapo mm. and Vichy mm. and Initially, this seemed a very straightforward story because at the end of the war, and not very long after that, um, when the French were looking for things that they had done which were good during the Vichy years, yes. they fell on this story of the plateau which had saved so many people. The problem was the story wasn't exactly as they celebrated it. Mm. And in the late 50s, early 60s, a historian called Allier went to Swarthmore College in America and chanced upon the memoirs of a pastor called Trochme, who had been the main Protestant pastor on the plateau. And he read this memoir, which roughly said, I saved, I found, I hid, I did. And he thought to himself, this is a wonderful story. So mm. he wrote it without checking. And after that, there was a spate of books and films about this wonderful place. And everything changed in 1990, when the new pastor, who'd long, Trockway was long since dead, of the, on the plateau, said, I'm sick of hearing all these slight rummagings, disagreements, and so on. I'll have a conference. So he held his conference and said to everybody on the plateau, come, and we'll sort out the events of the war. And when I went to see him in Lyon, he said, that was the single worst thing I did in my whole career as a priest because it unleashed a can of worms. And the can of worms consisted of the fact that the Protestants had always taken the line that they had done the saving. 
But in fact, so had the Catholics, so had people who weren't religious at all, and particularly so had this sect called the Darbist, who are an extreme Protestant sect. And they had big families and big farms, and they'd done a lot of the hiding. And so, of course, had the resistance and the maki. Mm. So from then, which is 1990 to now, there has always been this sense of embattlement, if you like. Yes. While people try and hold on to what they believe is their history of the plateau. Yes, because it's such an emotive time, I suppose. They've all got connections to it personally and in groups. Um, so to the extent that people perhaps in this country even know about this story, it's long been shrouded in misunderstanding and misapprehension, do you think? This is certainly my view. There have been lots of stuff mentioned and talked over the years about the Champon, which has been seen as this sort of um, perfect example um, of how people can behave well. In a sense, yes, they did behave well, but it was not this one village. It was the whole plateau. Hmm. It was not this one pastor. It was a huge range of people. And... It wasn't just one story, it was dozens of different stories. And in a sense, what was fun about this book was both looking at the story, but also unpicking this incredible network of arrangements that effectively saved people. Mm. Because the fact that it is so many different groups of people and villages makes it more extraordinary rather than less, I think, because this huge operation was going on. Um, heading back, I suppose, to the earlier part of the war, um, France had, to some extent, not been helping people who were being persecuted by the Nazis, had they? No. Um, very early in the war, the French set up camps. In fact, they'd already had camps at the end of the 30s for, um, well, for the, the Spanish Republicans who came in were still in camps. Um, they also had camps for uh, communists, the moment we went into the war. So these camps already existed in various different places. However, under pressure, they quite quickly began rounding up foreign Jews. And Laval made a sort of pact with the Germans, a sort of, um, a sort of terrible pact, which in the end nobody kept to, which he, roughly he said to the Germans, I will give you our foreign Jews as long as you leave our French Jews. So during those first years of the war, bit by bit, the foreign Jews were rounded up and put into camps. Now the fact is there were a lot of foreign Jews because France in the early 30s, particularly under the Blum left-wing government, had been very open to refugees. So people had poured in from, um, from Germany, from Poland and so on, and as anti-Semitism spread across German countries, so the French, so the Jews came to France, where they found welcome. So, in sort of from sort of 41, 42, they were rounded up these foreign Jews. And what I try and do in the book is I try and follow the story of a certain number of children who were foreign Jews who were rounded up and taken into the camps. Of course, after 42, when Germany occupied the whole of France, when all the French, all the foreign Jews had already been deported, the, uh, the Vichy turned to the French Jews. So, as much as anything, the story, by the time it reaches the plateau, is a story of both foreign Jews and French Jews. Mm. The stories of some of the children's experiences in the camps are really affecting. Um, what kind of situation did they find when they were, when they were they taken there? I always think the stories of the French camps are very little known. Um, the immediate deportation camps, um, which were up in the um, up in the in the French zone, um, are more known about. Um, and Drancy is known as the deportation camp. What I think very few people know is these huge concentration camps that there were in the south, um, by near the border with with um, with Spain, and. You know, honestly, they were very little different from the early German concentration camps. They were barracks where there was no heating and no light. Um, the sanitary conditions were terrible. There was not enough food. And people died. Mm. People died in these camps. Surrounded um, by mud as well, the thing that sticks out to me. In the terrible. Yeah. Some of the stories about how the children had to go for food, and you could see them. You remember, you had pictures of them wading through the mud. Uh, those, the conditions were terrible. Mm. And so... Given this dire situation, how did people go about starting to get children out of these camps? Well, that is where the story is so lovely. There were different organisations. I mean, in a way, the book is divided into two parts. The first part is all these people needing help. 
So what I do is I trace my way through the, the camps and Paris and the roundups, and I follow these children and watch where they're coming to. And then I take them up to the plateau, and then I describe life on the plateau. Um, what was happening to these children is they were being picked up with their parents, and they were being taken into the camps. And a whole group again, of not particularly related organizations, some of them Catholic, some of them Protestant, some of them Jewish, started to say, we have to save the children. Mm -hmm. And a number of astonishingly enlightened and brave people set up networks to save the children. And they found children, they spirited up to the, to the, to the plateau, they put them into homes, they changed their names and so on. And there is a particularly wonderful story, I think, which is the story of Venetia. Venetia is a camp just outside Lyon, and it happened relatively late when there had been already a lot of deportations. And orders went up to round up the Jews in Lyon. Jews were duly rounded up and they were put into Venetia. And at this point, a group of these savers, two Catholic priests, um, you know, Protestant, uh, these, these were groups working for these, descended on the camp. And their mission was to save the children. And they went into the camp. They realized what was happening. They knew the children were going to Auschwitz. So they went in and they took with them forms. And these forms were release forms to give to the parents to sign to give them over the children. And one of the most heart-rending bits of my research was following these accounts of, of these, these rescuers, if you like, saying to the parents, we can't save you, but if you sign this, we'll save your children. Because they had to sign these forms in France due to French law. Um, some of the stories of what happened when these forms had to be signed, all these people crying, obviously. It just sounds horrendous. It was obviously the most terrible scenes, and it was made worse by the fact that uh, the electricity had been put out by a storm. So they were doing all this in the dark. They were going from family to family in the dark, realizing they only had a very few number of hours left, and realizing that at best they would be able to save a couple of hundred children. And as time went on, they became more and more almost brutal in their desire to get these children away. How many children did they end up managing to save? In this? They saved about 120. I know it sounds small, but in the greater scheme of things, none of those children would have survived otherwise. It's an incredible operation. And how did they physically transport them away from these camps? Very brilliantly. They were, they were wonderfully scheming, these people. They really did. They were imaginative. They had got a number of buses lined up. And... Um, one of them, Père Chaillet, had intercepted a telegram. Um, there was some debate among the Germans and Vichy as to whether they were going to deport the children, and this debate went on. It was slightly coloured by the fact that um, they didn't want public opinion to go against them to see parents, small children, being deported. So this was going on. And a telegram came to the prefect of Lyon from the Germans saying, we'll take the children too. And it was intercepted by somebody in the prefect's office who rushed it round to Père Chaillet, who hid it and went into the camp, said to the man running the camp, children aren't yet on the list, um, so we're going to take the children. And it was not until the buses had driven away that the error was discovered. Once they'd managed to, to take the children away, what's the geographical area like that they were then taken to? Um, the plateau is in pretty well in the middle of France. It's, um, it's southeast of Lyon, and it's west of Le Puy. And Le Plateau um, is it, very hard to reach. And if you remember the war years, the weather was still very much harsher than it is now. So for two or three months a year, the plateau was cut off. And it has a little windy road which goes up to the plateau. And there was a train. There was something that looks like a toy train that used to go up. And those were the ways up to the plateau. Mm. So what would happen? Would it, let me take this group of children. Um, they save the children. They immediately hide them in convents and presbyteries and with families around Lyon, which is where it's going on. And then, in twos and threes, they squirrel them away. And they squirreled a number one number of them onto the little train, up into the mountains, to the plateau. When they get to the plateau, and one of the women is with them, one of the women organizers from one of these organizations, she goes to a hotel in the square of, of Le Chambon and lets it be known that she has a group of children. And quite quickly, people from the plateau arrive. No cars then, horses, traps, arrive, and a farmer will come in and say, I can take two six-year-old children, or I can take 
a family of sisters or whatever. So within a couple of hours, these children have all been hidden away on the mountain. How overt was that made? Was it just the children arrived and then were taken without much communication about what actually was happening? Was it just kept very low-key? It was kept very low-key, mm. particularly because at a certain point, slightly later on, the Germans put a convalescent home for German soldiers from the Eastern Front in this village of Le Chambon. And the extraordinary thing is that the rescue operation continued after they were there. The question always was, how did it go on? Well, the answer was, these were ordinary German soldiers. They were not Gestapo. They were convalescent. They were quite vulnerable up on the plateau. It was not in their interest to shock people. But one of the people I interviewed um, was, the girl, was a girl, a Jewish girl, daughter of a man who ran a home in which half the pupils were Jewish. And their house abuts what was the um, convalescent home. And this little girl with whom I went there showed me that her, from her bedroom window she looked out on the Germans doing their exercises. So in a way, the, the extraordinary thing was this, this plateau, this life on the plateau, existed despite the Germans. Mm. What was everyday life like then for children on this plateau? In many ways, it was very ordinary. They were put into schools. Um, they lived in children's homes where they were looked after by people. Who, you know, their names weren't necessarily changed, though some had their names changed. And they went with the other children to school, and they went to the local schools, and they lived that way until the end of the war. Whenever there were raids, because one should say that the, the, the plateau was raided by the Germans, and there were some disasters. I mean, some people were caught and taken away. Um, they would be hidden on the mountain. Um, they, there were obviously people who let the plateau know if a German raid was on the way. They weren't always able to do that, which is why some people were lost. But quite often, they were, somebody sent a message to say, you are going to be visited by the Germans and the police. And then the children would be rushed into the woods, very wooded area, and they would spend the day hidden in the woods until... Late in the day, there would be songs and whistles which would indicate they were safe to go back. Do we get a sense of how they coped with this sense that at any point there might be um, a siren, a, like an alarm for them to, to head off to the woods? Yes, I wouldn't want the picture to be too sugary. Um, one of the problems with the myth was the myth was, you know, all these children were safe and everybody lived happily ever after. Life is not like that. Um, the children were lonely. They missed their parents. They were frightened. Many of them had no news of their parents. Because one of the agreements made for the children coming up, sometimes parents, for one reason or another, stayed in hiding in the rest of France and sent their children up. And they had to agree that there would be no communication because communication was just too dangerous. So a lot of these children had lost everything they knew. Um, and they had no news of their parents, and they were young. And the records of many of them, and some of the ones I talked to, are not happy ones. You also have to remember that the, the inhabitants of the plateau were quite door people. Um, Huguenots, by their religion, are quite door. The Darbeast are even more door. They are totally um, God-fearing, Bible-reading, austere, um, at that stage anyway, no cinema, no, no radio, no. And the children were lonely, and some of these children in these Darbeast families were indeed saved, but they were not happy. And by the time, by the end of the war, when they came out, a lot of these children were fairly disturbed. How old were they, we should mention, at the time they were taken um, up? Uh, yeah. Anything from babies to... Um, 17, 18 year olds. So really young in some cases. Oh, very young yeah, in some cases. Yeah. And of course, a lot of adults too. It was The story isn't only about children. There are quite a number of adults. And the adults come into play because quite soon it was absolutely clear that there was no room on the plateau for everybody. And they needed to get people out. Now, the only safe place by now was Switzerland. But Switzerland was famously um, unwelcoming. Um, in 1942, the Swiss, just when the Germans invaded the whole of France, the Swiss made it perfectly clear they weren't taking in any more Jews. 
and um, I mean, this is something the Swiss have had to live down for the rest of the time. So the question was, how did you smuggle people in Switzerland? Uh, another network, another network of organisers, and one of the places it went from was the plateau. Uh, there were a number of scouts, interestingly, the, the, the ones who, in a way, did best with the Boy Scouts, who took parties of people. It couldn't be two young children, because they couldn't make the journey. Um, across the distance between Le Chambon and the, and the Swiss border. And there are wonderful stories, um, which I try to tell in the book, of some of these journeys to the border and trying to get across and um, a whole network of priests and scouts and uh, Jewish organizations and how they worked out when there weren't any guards and when they could get to the border and how they would get across. Because once the children were across in Switzerland, the Swiss didn't put them back. What helped to hear this? massive group of separate organisations um, together into this one effort that almost seems to go unspoken about in some cases. I think in a funny way, it's a mistake to see it as one effort. I think it has lots of different strands, which in a sense what made it so fascinating to write about, because I would start down one track and I would realise it led in one direction, and then I'd suddenly realise that there was another direction which was very interesting, which involved a whole lot of other people. For instance, the resistance. Now, the Maquis got going early in 43, when the French tried to send a lot of young French to Germany to help with the war effort in Germany, Vichy. And this really did feed into the Maquis, and the Maquis too needed somewhere to hide. So they all came rushing up onto the plateau. Um, so that was a whole other theme. And figures who can't be left out of this equation are the forgers, because everybody, the, the grown-ups, the children tended to be more hidden, but all the adults who came, both Jews and communists and resistors and so on, needed false IDs. So a whole lot of people set about forging IDs. And one of them was a very young Jewish doctor, um, medical student. Um, another was a middle-aged English woman who happened to be teaching one of the local schools. And a whole group of these people would spend their days and indeed their nights forging different ID papers. Um, and they had a network of people in the plains who, who provided them with forms. So what they would do is they would falsify pictures, backgrounds, and they would choose um, backgrounds in places where they knew the archives had been destroyed. So there was no way that the police picking up these people could check that they had really come from some other part of France. Mm. How did the authorities view this whole story? One of the most interesting bits of the research was going through the police um, and prefect archives in the area, because what I wanted to establish was what, who knew what when, which is always one of the things that really fascinates me. Mm. Now, there was a prefect called Bach, and he was the prefect of the Haute-Loire, so he was really the prefect of the area. Uh, and there was a, a German commandant called Schmeling, and he was the German in charge at Puy. Now, how much did these two men know? It's very difficult to say. From the papers and letters and from reports by Bach, it would seem that he was not keen to know what was going on there. He, he didn't initiate attacks on the, and on the, on the plateau. But, and it's impossible to know whether he prevented them. At the end of the war, he was tried, and a lot of local people came out in his favour, and he was released. Um, Schmeling, I think it would be totally wrong. You see, part of the original myth was that there was a good German, Schmeling, and a good prefect, Bach, and this wonderful pastor, Trockney. Mm. And between them, this is what, this was the conspiracy of good, which was the Hannah Arendt sort of slight perversion, conspiracy of good rather than conspiracy of evil. I think that is going too far. Um, but I do think that Bach could have been a much more collaborating prefect than he was. I think Schmeling, who was nearing retirement, uh, just wanted to get to the end of the war. I don't think it was in anybody's interest to carry out too many raids on the plateau. But okay. some did happen. Some people were taken away. Mm. Some children did not return. After the war, 
um, what experiences do people in, in this story have following this huge thing in their lives, I suppose? There was a very f sad comment in Trockner's memoirs, and it was that when the end of the war came and liberation came, uh, the people who'd taken refuge there flew away like birds. Somebody to whom I put that in Israel said, oh, yes, of course, but you have to understand that we wanted to get on with our lives and we needed to put behind us what had happened. Um, people left, the children, where they still had parents. I mean, there was a great search for parents, and many then found they didn't have any parents anymore. But in the immediately months after the war, um, an organization called Lose set about trying to put in touch children with their parents. Some children had to be brought back from Switzerland, where they'd been spending the rest of the war. France was in a turmoil, you know, everybody was scattered. Um, and people left the plateau, and the plateau reverted to what it had been before, which was a place of tourism and so on. What was very noticeable was that in recent years, it's become in a way a place of pilgrimage for the people who had been hidden. And people have gone back up to the plateau and tried to look at the places where they were hidden. And their grandchildren have come. And they've marked out, you know, they've remembered and marked out the different spots where they hid and where they were hidden, what it was like during the war. And that is quite touching. That was Caroline Moorhead. Village of Secrets, Defying the Nazis in Vichy, France, is out now in the UK, published by Chateau and Windus, and will be published by Harper in the US in October. Before our next interview, here's a reminder that tickets are still on sale for our History Weekend in Malmesbury. It's taking place from the 16th to the 19th of October, and features talks from some of the UK's leading historians, authors and broadcasters. For more information and tickets, please visit historyweekend.com. Our second interview this week is with historian and author Matthew Parker. Matthew's latest book is called Golden Eye, and it tells the story of Jamaica in the mid-20th century through the eyes of one of its most famous residents, British writer Ian Fleming. Best known for creating the James Bond character, Fleming spent two months of each year in Jamaica at his house which he named Golden Eye and it was there that he wrote his famous 007 novels. Although the books are, of course, works of fiction, they do offer interesting insights into Jamaican history and to Fleming's own view of the changes taking place on the island. I spoke to Matthew a couple of weeks ago to find out more about Fleming, Bond and Jamaica, and I began by asking him to give us a little bit of background about Fleming's life. Fleming is, of course, best known as the creator of James Bond. And what I find particularly interesting about him, I was out in Jamaica researching my previous book, Sugar Barons, and came across this place, Goldeneye, which Fleming built in 1946, and actually spent two months of every year out there, which I hadn't realized. And even more interestingly, all of the James Bond stories, the novels and the short stories, were created in Jamaica at Goldeneye, which I found fascinating. Ian Fleming, I, mean, I believe he, he was involved in the Secret Services during the war, is, is that right? Yes, he had a sort of strange childhood. His father died in the First World War in 1917 when he was eight. And after that, he was at boarding school where he was very badly bullied uh, and really sort of built a sort of internal armour around himself. He was a very sort of distant, aloof and rather strange character. He went on to Eton but didn't get to the end of that. He was actually removed from Eton. Then he went to Sandhurst. That didn't work out either. And then his very forceful mother got him a job uh, at Reuters, which I think he, he enjoyed and that was the, really the beginning of his sort of writing career. But he wanted to make money, so he went into the city and was, as he describes it, the world's worst stockbroker. And really, he was rescued by the war. He was recruited through an old boy network into naval intelligence, and 
was actually the assistant to the head of naval intelligence. And he loved the war. He loved the excitement and all of the uh, amazing schemes that he dreamt up and the gadgets. And then really when the war came to an end, he was sort of rather cast adrift. What, what he ended up doing was getting a job as the foreign manager at the Sunday Times. But he stipulated that he would only take the job if he could have two months off every year to go to Jamaica. His first visit to Jamaica was actually during the war in 1943. He went out to attend an Anglo-American naval conference, which was addressing the very serious problem of U-boat attacks in the Caribbean. And there were these wonderful Bond-like rumors that a Swedish a millionaire with connections to Hermann Goering had set up a secret submarine base on his paradise island. And this turned out to be nonsense. I mean, the Caribbean is full of these sort of wild stories. It's full of rumors and exaggeration. And of course, we see all that in Bond as well. And really, he fell in love with Jamaica in 1943 and was determined to return, build himself a house there and write books. So when he was in Jamaica, what kind of a life did he lead there? Well, it, it sort of changed. I think when he first went out there in, in 46, I think a lot of the appeal of Jamaica to him was how incredibly old-fashioned it was. I mean, Jamaica in 1946, it could almost have been 1846. It was a real place of old imperial sort of certainties which had been lost um, in England. I mean, Britain obviously came out of the Second World War uh, totally bankrupt and with a commitment to start shedding the empire. And Jamaica seemed to be this lovely imperial backwater where there was great deference shown to, to whites, to the rich, to, to English people in particular. But of course, Jamaica was actually under a process of quite radical change. So why did Ian Fleming start writing these novels then when he was there? Well, he always claimed, much to the annoyance of his wife, Anne, that he did it to put off the horrible sort of vision of matrimony. The first uh, James Bond novel, Casino Royale, was written in January 1952, and a month later he married, um, he was a confirmed bachelor in his, in his 40s by then, but he married Anne Fleming, who had been his longtime lover, and really... They were very, very different creatures. She was intensely sociable. She was a London um, society hostess par excellence. But Fleming was a very different creature. He liked his own company. He was very solitary. He was fairly antisocial. And I think apart from anything else, being able to retreat to his bedroom or inside at Goldeneye, shut the shutters and, and write, gave him back a sort of private space that he, that he relished. How much of the Bond novels do you think was influenced by the place that he wrote them, by Jamaica? Well, what I wanted to do, I mean, I was very struck by, as I said, I was very struck by the fact that all of the books were written in Jamaica. And then a year or so later, I was watching, along with billions of people around the world, I was watching the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. And of course, the climax of that is the Queen and James Bond in this hilarious spoof of parachuting into the, into the stadium. And of course, this is very funny. But then you suddenly thought, well, hold on a second. How has James Bond achieved such iconic status? He's this great British anachronism. And I think it's worth looking again at him, I thought. And so I wanted to see, really reread the books from the point of view of when and where they are created. You know, they were created in a particular historical moment from 1952 to 64 in colonial Jamaica. And if you actually look at the books afresh from, from this point of view, you really discover just how immensely imbued with Jamaica they all are in all sorts of different ways. So when you say they're imbued with Jamaica, is that directly that he's talking about Jamaica in the books? Is it more just the sort of sense of life in Jamaica comes through in other events? Well, I think there's, there's a certain amount of very simple content. Three of the novels were set largely in Jamaica. Several of the short stories were also set there. Others feature other places in the Caribbean or other places in the tropics that are very similar. And I think most people would agree that the very best parts of the James Bond thrillers are the underwater scenes, the scenes on the reef. And that, of course, comes directly from Fleming's experience at Goldeneye. He loved 
nothing more than going out on the reef, snorkeling, diving, fishing for lobsters, dodging the barracudas and the sharks, and also other bits of the Caribbean. Again, if you look at the books afresh, you will find they are riddled with references to pirates. Even Goldfinger, for instance, which is, of course, set in the UK and in the US, Goldfinger himself, the villain, is described as being like Henry Morgan attacking Portobello or Panama City. That's the simile that, that Fleming uses. And there's all sorts of references to lovable pirates. And, and again, Henry Morgan crops up again and again. But more than that, it's so many of the ingredients that Fleming threw together in, in that room at GoldenEye, whether it's the jet-set tourist world that Bond moves in, whether it's the constant sort of aching concern with the decline of empire, whether it's the race, again, which is a great concern of Fleming's, or rivalry with the United States, all of these roads lead back to Jamaica. And you mentioned before that the situation in Jamaica at the time was changing quite rapidly. Do you get a sense of, of these changes within his novels? You, you do and you don't. I mean, it's, I was fascinated by... Fleming loved Jamaica, but he loved, if you like, a version of Jamaica, his version of Jamaica. And I'm fascinated by his relationship with the place and, you know, what shaped that. But certainly if you look at one of the earliest novels, the second novel, Live and Let Die, the Jamaica that's portrayed is quite touristic. It's several times Fleming praises the fact that parts of Jamaica seemed unchanged for hundreds of years. And this was, for him, a good thing. But, of course, for black Jamaicans, particularly poor black Jamaicans, unchanged for hundreds of years was a disaster. It meant that there was no health care, no proper education, no uh, water or electricity. And really there's this interesting clash between Fleming's view of Jamaica and black Jamaicans view of Jamaica. And this is particularly prevalent when Fleming talks about the history of Jamaica. He loves all of these stories about pirates, the maroons, the runaway slaves who lived in the, in the mountains of the interior. And he loved the, the ruins of the great houses. These sort of, he loved this sort of melancholy decline feel. But for other Jamaicans, all of these things were urgent social problems that needed addressing. And occasionally in the novels, if you look at a, a later novel, Dr. No, which was written in 1957, the year after Suez, which is, of course, a turning point in the story of the wider empire. And in Jamaica, there have been changes as well. There have been much more uh, power given to elected representatives. There was a real momentum towards self-government. And this sort of creeps in between the lines of Dr. No. Right at the beginning, Fleming suddenly announces, when he's talking about the Queen's Club, the bastion of white colonial rule, he suddenly says, drops his bombshell, he says, one day the windows will be smashed and this place will be burnt to the ground. But for now, it's just surviving. And there is that sense that empire in Jamaica and certainly in sort of the wider world is now a, a, a very precarious thing. Jamaica did achieve independence when Fleming was still alive and, and still writing the novels, I believe. How did he respond to that event? It's fascinating. Jamaica became independent in August 1962 after the breakup of the West Indian Federation that had been set up in 58. And Jamaica was at that time a very optimistic place. The tourism was booming. There was bauxite. There were remittances coming in from the, the diaspora. And it was a very forward-looking time. Now, as it turned out, a lot of those promises at independence weren't met. And for Fleming, he was rather unique in his attitude. A lot of the white expatriates, because throughout the 1950s, there'd been this um, massive movement of the, the rich from the UK and America buying up houses, whether it was Errol Flynn, whether it was Noel Coward, Ivan Novello, and they'd set up this, it's been compared to Happy Valley in Kenya, this decadent, bed-hopping, rather drunken, parallel world going on while the black Jamaicans are sort of fighting for independence. Uh, and a lot of them actually sold up and left. They didn't want to be part of an independent Jamaica. They thought that the country would go to the dogs. Fleming was a bit different. He was 
much more open to Jamaican music and food and people than a lot of the other expatriates. But if you look at his final novel, which was written in 64, The Man with the Golden Gun, which is rather an incomplete and rather a disappointing end to his writing career. But if you look at that, it's almost as if independence hasn't happened. At no point do you come across Jamaicans who aren't waiters, sex workers, or taxi men, or musicians, and power in the land still seems to be firmly in the hand of British expatriates. They own the hotels, they own the businesses, and it's almost as if Fleming's in denial about independence, that he's retreated into a sort of fantasy bubble where British rule still holds sway in Jamaica. Now, during the period that Fleming went to live in Jamaica, his books became very famous. How did the change in that affect his own lifestyle? Well, it's really all linked to his wife, Anne. Who, she was a very difficult woman. She was a crashing intellectual snob. She had a circle that included Lucy and Freud, Evelyn Waugh, Peter Quinnell, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge, and a host of other of the sort of luminaries of the, the day. She was having an affair with Hugh Gates, called the leader of the Labour Party, was a close friend of Roy Jenkins, of Winston Churchill. And really, she looked down on the Bond books. She refused, when Ian offered to dedicate his first novel, Casino Royale, to her, she said rather sniffily, surely this isn't the sort of book one dedicates to anybody. And all the way through his career, she rather disparagingly called them comic books and pornography. Um, and was even mocked his work. And as they became more and more successful, so this affected their relationship. She bridled at this, although enjoyed spending the money, and he became ever more resentful that his books were so despised by her and her circle. So it was success that didn't... I mean, he liked the money, and he needed the money to pay for Goldeneye, apart from anything else. But he felt that they weren't really appreciated by Anne, which is, of course, why he tried the experimental novel The Spy Who Loved Me, which was, of course, a, a critical disaster. Now, we've talked quite a lot about the books, but I, I suppose most people out there will know the James Bond films even better than the books. Do you get much of a sense of Jamaica in the films as well? I think you do in that the films really are very Fleming-like. They almost out Fleming Fleming in their style and their approach. Even the, the sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek approach of the films, the sort of parodic elements, that's all there in the books as well. And what I found most interesting was looking at the filming of Dr. No, which was, of course, the first movie and sort of launched this extraordinarily successful franchise. And this was filmed in early 1962 in Jamaica, so months before independence. And if you look again at the film, you'd see it. I mean, let's look at the beginning. I, probably most people will be familiar with it. You have the, the three blind beggars walking towards Queen's Club, where they're going to murder the Secret Service man, Strangways. And it starts off in, in downtown Kingston, and you see a very modern background with cars and pylons and so on. But then at the end of the first shot, you see in the background the statue of Queen Victoria, which is in Victoria Square. And then, even though they're supposed to be walking north to New Kingston, where the club is, they actually, the next shot, you see them walking down towards the port, and there on their right is another colonial statue, and this is, I think, Metcalf, who was the governor of Jamaica in the 1840s, and obviously pleased the statue-sponsoring population. And effectively, you know, these people are on a tour of Imperial Kingston. And of course, other bits of the film are even more obvious. You have the, the King, you have the Queen's Club with these, the, the four people. There's the professor, there's the army guy, and there's the secret service guy and someone else. And then you have King's House where you have a soldier in sort of Raj style khaki shorts and saluting Gurkha soldiers and so on. I mean, it really is Jamaica as part of the empire. And of course, by the time the film comes out, at the end of 62, Jamaica is independent, and there's no hint of this at all in the film anywhere. So in a way, the films 
continue this fantasy of continual British power. I mean, of course, the figure of Bond himself, he's an imperial hero. He destroys the world and projects British power all over the place in the way that perhaps used to be the case, but certainly post Suez and certainly post the rush of independence in the early 60s. This is, this is a consoling fantasy now for, for the British audience. And at the time that Ian Fleming was writing these novels, how did people in Jamaica react to them? Very few of them actually read them, actually. I spoke to a lot of people around Oracabessa, where, where Goldeneye was, and sort of all over Jamaica. And everyone's seen the films, but very few people have read the books. There was one very interesting thing that I found in the Daily Gleaner, which is the, the sort of establishment paper in Kingston. Uh, and they, when Live and Let Die came out, which is all about Jamaica, they reviewed it. And it was the sort of the normal white guy reviewing. And he said, this is a great thriller and very exciting. And, you know, isn't it great that Jamaica's been put on the map by, by these stories? And, and then about a year later, it was reviewed again when it came out in paperback, but this time by a, a young black writer who found it, not to put too many words on it, found it actually rather offensive. And certainly now, if you read Live and Let Die, it seems quite extraordinarily obviously racist. I mean, there's a chapter called Nigger Heaven. There is this portrayal of a local helper called Quarrel, who, of course, appears in Dr. No as well, who is... You know, every sort of colonial cliche you can imagine. He's childlike, he's naturally subservient, he's superstitious and rather childish and fearful. And some black Jamaicans found this betrayal to be, as I said, offensive. And what about nowadays? How does Jamaica feel about Fleming and Bond these days? I think certainly after Dr. No was... Was, was made, which employed a lot of Jamaican actors. I mean, I think it's easy to forget Dr. No was made on a total shoestring, and they tried to use as many local people as possible. And for Jamaicans, this is like Fleming was described as a sort of one-man industry in Jamaica. And certainly people are very pleased if it helps the tourist business. And now, of course, there's a small airstrip near Goldeneye, which has been renamed the Ian Fleming airport, which for some is great because it means that, again, people will come to Jamaica and appreciate that this is the place where this amazing creation came about. But other people, in fact, the sign was, when it was first put up, was vandalized several times, think that it should have been a Jamaican who was given the honor rather than, rather than a British expatriate. If you're a listener out there and you want to find out more about Ian Fleming in Jamaica. Is there one of his novels in particular you'd recommend they read? I think it would probably have to be Dr. No. I think that that is the one where less of the cliché views. I think if you, if you look at Live and Let Die and The Man with the Golden Gun, as I said, you'll find a very touristic, a slightly detached portrayal of the island, appreciating, of course, its incredible natural beauty and its old-fashioned values. But if you look at Dr. No, then there's slight slightly more edgy portrayal of the island. I think some of the, the cracks in the imperial facade do show in that novel like nowhere else. That was Matthew Parker. Goldeneye, where Bond was born, Ian Fleming's Jamaica, has just been published by Hutchinson. And Matthew has also written an article for our September issue where he picks out three novels that best reflect Fleming's views on Jamaica. Also in our September issue which has just gone on sale, we explore Thomas Cromwell's fractious relationship with Henry VIII, we reveal some of Britain's audacious plans to repel a Nazi invasion, and we chart the descent of ancient Rome into a century of chaos and civil war. If you like the sound of any of that, then why not get hold of a copy at all good news agents or digitally. OK, so that's almost all for this week. Please do join us next time when we'll be broadcasting a lecture from our 2013 History Weekend Festival. Thanks for listening to this History Extra podcast, which was produced by Jack Fletcher. Do let us know what you think about this episode by emailing podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out your messages in future episodes. Alternatively, why not keep in touch via Twitter or Facebook, where you'll find us at History Extra. For more great history content, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you will find history quizzes, galleries, articles and more. 
Plus, it's where you can download every single previous episode of this podcast.